Mississippi. I was only eight. So can you so, start for uh, everybody and so, just let, let us know what year you were born, where you were born? I, I was born November 16th, 1946 in Chicago by uh, two communists, um, one who was born in New York, the other one born in Chicago. And I was the second child. <clears throat> My dad at the point was working as a organizer for the United Electrical Workers Union and subsequently went and headed the trade union work for the Communist Party in Chicago and then in the Midwest. As the Communist Party got smaller, his jobs got bigger. My mom was a community organizer for for, for the Communist Party, besides having more of the household work. Male chauvinism, what, they, what we now call sexism, was very prevalent. My mom did double duty. She was very political, built and believed devoutly in having a revolution and a multiracial unity. I came from a family that believed in multiracial unity. Um, one of the famous slogans of the Communist Party of the 30s and 40 was black and white unite and fight. And in our house, there were workers from every ethnic community in Chicago and said Chicago was like 40% black and they were among the most oppressed and exploited. They were the most oppressed and exploited work any of the communists. And I grew up being in their houses and them being in our houses. So, and one of my first memories is my mom taking me to the wake of Emmett Till uh, on the south side. I was very young, but I have this memory of being there. And I knew who Emmett Till was. Wow. And I knew what. Yeah. Um, were your parents so, immigrants or were they first generation or had they been? First in- uh, my first, my dad's, my grandfather immigrated from the area around Odessa. And of course, there's nobody left there. He left because as a Jew, he would have had to be in the Tsar's army. And that was a death sentence for a Jew. So how, somehow they got enough money for my grandfather to come over to uh, the Lower East Side of New York. And then he, of course, worked and brought his, my grandmother. And I'll say this, the uh, life they had as immigrants People think the Jews came were rich and so responsible. Some of the worst bastards, Jewish criminals. There's a book by Michael Gold uh, called Jews Without Money. It's a famous communist novel, which is not so famous now. But I, it tells you the, uh, the story of what it was like to live in the Lower East Side and then there in neighborhoods like Brownsville and Brooklyn, where uh, there were gangs, there were pimps, and there were hardworking, working class people who um, built families. And then there were a lot of communists. At first, they were socialists, and then during the split in uh, 1919, or 1917, but among the communist parties, some remained socialist, some went with Lenin and Stalin and became communists. So my dad became a communist. My grandfather worked his guts out so he could have a little business as a furrier. And the, the family always said if, if he would give up his little business, he'd have a life. 
but he just he just he wanted to be his own boss, and he wanted his sons to take over the business. And both of my dad and my mom, uncle said, "No way, we're not doing this the rest of our life." My dad moved from New York because he was in the Communist Party, and um, he knew all the trade union people because he was. Even at that fairly young age, he was a pretty prominent union kind of guy by the time of his party. And he was working for his dad, helping out. And a guy comes in and he sees my grandfather give him some money. Well, so happens the guy was a business agent for the communist union. So my dad turned in the guy. And my grandfather went ballistic. How could you do this to my business? What my grandfather was doing was getting the business agents to look the other way for some infraction of the contract. The family was torn apart. So my father was sent to Chicago. There was a need. There was all. There were always a need in Chicago for trade union. Chicago was the most industrial city in, in the United States at that point. The railroads, the electrical union, auto, steel, you had everything in Chicago. And you think about it, it is, it is without question, the most beautifully, aesthetically pleasing city in terms of buildings, in terms of architecture. Absolutely, and you had to have the most skilled people there. The people, the, I've, I live in California, but my heart is still in Chicago. Chicago also was the headquarters of the IWW, the International Workers of the World. For a while, it was the headquarters of the Socialist Party. It was the headquarters of the Communist Party for a while. It, it was the, the center that the Communist Party said, trained and sent people out. So many of my dad's friends came to Chicago, then they went to Cleveland. They were colonizers. They were sent, that's how the, the Congress of Industrial Organizations was mainly built on the sweat, blood of communists going, other than the coal miners union where, um, John L. Lewis had his own fiefdom. Communists organized all these industrial unions and fought against racism. So, uh, skipping ahead a little bit, one of my mom's dad's best friends, I cry was a woman named Sylvia Woods. And she was a black woman from Louisiana. And she came up and she met some communists. She always went to church. And she believed in God and she believed in communism. And you know what we said, go with God. Believe. There was no better fighter for black workers than Sylvia Woods. There's a movie called Union Maids, where she in it, in it. Of course, it never mentions that she was a communist. So I, she, her, and Henry, who worked for, um, um, I can't remember the company, but, uh, but you know, was always working. Henry, um, sort of, they had an open house, and we would stay there when our parents were busy, especially during the McCarthy period which is another formative thing for me. I was uh, one of these people in the civil rights movement who always hated the FBI. Because um, in the late, early 50s, there was something called the Smith Act, which outlined the Communist Party and said that uh, any party that uh, advocated the forcible overthrow of the United States government was illegal. And also there was something called the Taft-Hartley Act where you couldn't 
belong to the Communist Party and be a union leader was against the law. So I grew up knowing that there was freedom and there was freedom. So Sylvia went to work at Sunbeam, which was, I don't know, they made razors and mixers. I don't know if some, Sunbeam is still around. Anyway, she worked on the west side of Chicago and the, the Communist Party fought to make her the first black steward in a non-white um, department. She was the first black steward in that plant, probably in the city of Chicago. And that was through the fight of the Communist Party. The Communist Party, we were taught to fight racism. And we were taught that, uh, and many of the leaders were selected based on their ability to fight. And always black workers were among the best fighters because they were among most expressed and exploited. And they had tremendous social networks because to survive in the black community, you had to have friends or have something. So, um, that was sort of how I grew up. And so, so they met each other through the unions or? or they met them the, each other through the Communist Party. Through the Communist some, Party. Some kind of activity. Mm -hmm. they, they had all kinds of stuff. They had a Norwegian hall. They had a Finnish hall. They had a language. They had language papers. They had a tremendous base among oppressed workers, exploited workers, many of them who were immigrants and who were people of color. Those were the people who were most willing to say, yeah, this thing about America, BS, I want a revolution. We're not talking about the majority of any of these things, but a significant portion where there would be big fights among the Hungarians, among the Lithuanians, um over who who's which paper would you read? Would you read the archdiocese version or would you read the communist version? Because the Catholic Church was a big they were what the rich people used to fight the communists. And the Catholic Church was tremendously powerful in Chicago. Probably still is. So my parents met, they had my sister Betsy, who was named after somebody called Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who was the original rebel girl. She led the IWW strike in Patterson of Italian and Jewish workers in 1905, 1906. And I came along and I was named after Frederick Douglass and Friedrich Engels. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> names that I could never live up to. But I'm very proud and happy that my parents gave me those names. Um, but so my parents gave me a gift. They gave me a gift of the love of the working class of being an anti-racist. And uh, my parents weren't perfect. I mean, my dad, he went from being in his mom's house, to being uh, with my mother, to being my stepmother. And he never really carried his weight as, as we view what a, what a person should do in a, in a family. He was a loving father. He was a great father, but he was a chauvinist pig in many ways. I mean, um, but I love my dad and, uh, but he was a man of his time. and. Communist Party paid lip service to fighting sexism. And some places did a good job, but on the whole, that and, and the issue of homosexuality, you have to say, not so good. Could have done a lot better job. Hindsight 
but anyway. How did your mom meet Mamie Till? How did my mom do what? Story? How did she meet M Mamie Till, Emmett Till's mother? Well, well, she did community work. So she knew a lot of black workers. So, and um, uh, many of the, and she did community work in her community, which was a mainly white working class uh, area of Chicago, but also in the community in the West Side. And through that, uh, she met uh, the group that was around Emmett Till's mom. She didn't know her well, but she, there was a, a large number of the left were very, very active about this horrendous crime. I mean, it was just sickening what they did to this young guy. And I remember seeing the pictures of Jet, which was the little tabloid uh, magazine when I was young. I mainly looked at it because I had pictures of girls. But that was the, uh, Yeah, but her decision to, to make those pictures public changed everything. I mean, it really did. It changed the movement in so many different right. ways. And yeah. in ways you were too young to understand at the time, I'm sure, but. Yeah, but well, I'm sure I don't understand now very much. But also I, I grew up uh, going to uh, demonstrations for the Rosenbergs. And, and the, those, those two people were also murdered. Right. In different, different ways. So I had all that. In the late 50s, I was like, uh, and I, we, uh, uh, there's one other part of my life I think I, I need to share. And you can edit out as much of this as you want, of course. Um, during the McCarthy period, the CP thought, Communist Party thought there was going to be fascism based on the Taft Hartley and Smith had and, you know, the atomic bombs. And, you know, uh, we, we, when we were kids, we used to get under the seats in case there was a nuclear attack. What we what the wooden seat was going to save us from, I never quite understood. But anyway, that was Chicago Bombers. That's what they did. For, um, so the Communist Party, a, a number of their leaders were, were arrested, thrown in jail, and uh, 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 under mock trials. And the rest, the Communist Party said, well, we'll keep some above ground and we'll send well, others underground. And my dad was like a second or third level leader and they sent those leaders too. So my dad was underground for three to four years. And I, we only saw him once a year. And we, um, he would pick up stuff in a car and he'd tell us what our name was. And we spent two weeks with, uh, with my dad. My mom would periodically meet my dad. Um, um, and as a result of that and other things, um, The people of the CP took care of us. They called us the Smith Act kids. They would have benefits. My mom didn't have any money. She worked. But people made sure we had food on the table. And, um, and my mom, when uh, my friend, uh, Larry Fine, his dad was one of the top leaders. Like, he was in the polar girl. When he went underground, uh, they really wanted Larry, uh, wanted Fred, a couple other people. Never found some of these people. The FBI couldn't find half the people that they were looking for. Because the Communist Party had tremendous base among many, many workers who weren't going to give up. Um, uh, I got, we would go to New York 
my mom's family, they were embarrassed by us. And my, I had an uncle who owned a photography store, another uncle who was a dentist. He gave us free dental care, really sweet man, but they didn't, they were nice, but we would call Humphrey Democrats. I mean, establishment Democrats. Right, not working class, radical, nothing yeah, like but, your family. Yeah, but they, they all came from the working class. I mean, my uncle who was a dentist, supported his family delivering while while he was went to dental school. Mm -hmm. I mean he he came from nothing and he worked and he worked. He was the nicest man, but he didn't he thought if you worked hard and you did good, that that was enough. And he certainly didn't like the FBI coming to his dental office asking questions about his brother in law. We didn't really like anyway. Right. <laughs> so how old were you when, when your father had to do that? Do you remember? Uh well, this is in late uh early 50s. So I was like five or six. Wow. Till I was uh, nine or ten. I'm so sorry. Yeah, was, yeah well, you know, it, it is it is but it, I got a lot of stories out of it, Caroline. I'm, I am um, all right. Uh, I'm sure you do, but I, that's, I mean, that's, you, you think of, you know, every child in America that's been hurt by the, by the, you know, supposedly criminal justice system. And in some ways your father was a victim of that too. And that, that, you know, so, in many ways. Some, people, some people had a lot worse. Yeah. My dad had a job with the Communist Party when it came back. There were people who, there were workers who were thrown out of their jobs who were, if you were an unskilled, or even your skilled were, they were backlisted. They were machinists. There were all kinds of, you know, they talk about the Hollywood 10. Thousands of communists worked in the movie industry and they were blacklisted. Dalton Trumbull was a, a genius. What he endured is nothing compared to many of those workers who never worked in film again or only worked. They didn't have a horse ranch. I hate this movie about him because it glorifies the Hollywood 10, who were good people in many ways, but what ignores all the working class people who were shat upon. All right, and now I'll, I'll, an example from my family. Because the FBI were really looking for Fred Fine, and for some reason, uh, I don't remember, Doris and Larry had no place to stay that they could want to stay. So my mom took them in. They moved into our apartment. So we inherited their FBI. So... Every day the FBI was outside the house. And they would come to the house sometimes. And my mom refused to talk to them. And my sister had a spirit. She would cuss at them. She would say things to them. <laughs> she would do everything. And they would go to our Aunt Betty. She was just a white working class woman who was our neighbor, had been there, our neighbor for eight years. And she would go over there and then Betty would tell them, get away from me. They're my friends, they're my neighbors. And then there were other people, you know, but uh, um, as a result of uh, the constant harassment, my mom lost a job. Uh, we lost the apartment that we lived in for 11 years. Um, and we moved to an all black neighborhood because a uh, Communist Party member owned that building. So my mom was able to get an apartment um, that um, we could afford. So um, and I, so I, I went to a school called uh, Penn, which we called Penn Penitentiary. And we were like one of the four or five white kids there. And my sister, like I said, had a spirit. So um, 
we only went half days because it was segregated school. So uh, they would, rather than build a school or let black kids go to a white school, they just double, a, double us up, which I like because then I got to play baseball in the afternoon. Um, so anyway, there was an outbreak of lice. And a, one of the teachers made a remark, well, when it was all white kids, didn't have anything to do. And my sister said, that's not true. It wasn't like that. That's not right. My friends are clean. There's no, no, no. And the teacher said, you're talking back to me. And she drags my sister to, to, to the principal, another uh, B-I-T-C-H. And uh, she says, um, I'm calling your mother. And, but she says, go ahead. So she calls my mom. My mom calls down from school, from school, goes to school. And she hears it. Really? That's what my daughter said? Good for her. You guys don't have any reason doing that. And that's, you know, that's what I was taught. And when I went to New York, the family there traded me and Betsy like, like I was the, we were the children of their favorite son. And I would just give you one little example. Eventually we'll get to the civil rights movement. I, I guarantee you. This is all so related to it. It's so important to know the background. Yeah. yeah. It is. It is what the stuff of me. This is the movie that's in my head, right? So uh, uh, my mom was very fair skinned. My mom was very, very, very pretty. And most people didn't think she was Jewish. So my my uh, my dad brought my mom, and uh, they were talking about where did where did Sammy get? Blah, 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 blah. They were very provincial about non Jews, my grandparents, and my mother mother in perfect Yiddish said, "I'm Jewish, don't worry." <laughs> so the other story is this: my my, my grandmother was. She was functionally illiterate and she only spoke a little, eh, a little, some English, mainly Yiddish. And I don't think she could read it other, even in Yiddish because women in the old country weren't educated, wasn't important. Anyway, we're sitting there eating and we're having brisket or something. And I asked for milk. And my grandfather goes, ah, I want it. And my Grandmother says, shh, shh, Harry, give the boy what he wants. But she is, I grew up with people who put people first. And all the lies they talk about communists, I looked, said, I don't know who the fuck you're talking about. You're not talking about Sylvia Woods. You're not talking about my mom. You're not talking about Claude Lifewood. You're not talking about Harry Winston. You're not talking about Langston Hughes or W.E. Du Bois or Paul Robeson. Who the fuck are you talking about? You're talking about your figment of information. Now, there, not all these people were wonderful. And some of them were assholes. It takes all kinds. But some of them, I'll never be the person that they were. My friend Paul Harris, his dad fought in Spain, came back. They wouldn't let him in the army here. He was Robeson's bodyguard when Robeson came to Chicago. He needed a bodyguard. Paul Robeson needed a bodyguard. That's the kind of country, the greatest country in the world was. 
And unfortunately, a lot of young black people don't know who Paul Robeson is. So I tell them, you know, they don't know who Nina Simone is. They don't know about Mississippi Goddamn, which is a great song, wonderful song. I've written pieces around it. It's it's still so so relevant, unfortunately. Yeah, and then uh, there's a famous quote from her now, where she talks about how her and her friends would sit around talking about Lenin and Stalin and revolution, all the stuff that girls talk about. That's Nina Simone. Anyway. So how did you meet Stokely Carmichael? Well, let me say, I, I also did a lot of anti-war stuff. All right. So in 1964, I dropped out of college to find myself. I, I, I didn't find what I wanted in college. So I went down to Mississippi. And I was in a in a project in Greenville. All right. So fast forwarding, there were, there were good experiences there. There was a COFO meeting, and at that time there were a few there were fewer and fewer whites in SNCC staff. So we all most of us were confederated of of uh, federated organizations. I forget what COFO stand for, but it was the NAACP, uh, CORE, and SNCC. The SCLC did. And SNCC had four of the congressional districts, and CORE had the fourth, which is where Cheney, Goodman, and Turner were killed. Anyway, there was a staff meeting, and we were there was a big controversy about whites in the movement. There was a big kind of what whether it should be voting rights, or there should be less freedoms because there were a lot of issues, most of which I had only been in the state like a week, I mean a month and a half, three months. So I didn't have much of a handle. But something came up and I started talking about multiracial unity. I don't know. I got I got up in this meeting of hundreds of people and why I thought they I should be able to talk. I don't know. Looking back, I was only the, you know. Anyway, and I started talking about there had to be unity of blacks and whites and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, people just kept on talking. Nobody answered anybody. This was one of the most dysfunctional meetings. I think there's a meeting where Robert, Robert Moses decided he was going to leave the state. <laughs> He couldn't, he couldn't stand it anymore. So Stokely was the director for the second congressional district, which was the Delta, which was the heart of uh, of Mississippi in terms of what went on in the state. That's, that's where both of the senators came from. Most of, you know, Anyway, I was in my kibitzing with my director and up drives Stokely. And I was like, he was, he had an intellect and a charisma a few I've ever seen. I mean, I, I was just in awe of a man. I mean, I couldn't, you know, I was like, you know, who, you know, 19 years old. Or, well, I, I was still 18. Anyway, it was like, and the experiences he had, and he had a command of language, and, anyway, and he was funny. You know, it was just, you know. So I, he said, well, I came over to see you. I said, me? He said, yeah, we're going to have a white boat project. I said, yeah, you're going to be on it. I said, why? Because I I can't find anybody else, so you're going to be on it. <laughs> so you know, when we went on. Uh, you know, so like, you know, say no. So he explained to me that this was the last chance. 
that if they couldn't build unity between black and white, they had to go another way. I said, oh, thank you very much. Is there any answer? Anything else you want to dump on me? So, uh, of course, I said yes. So I, I was scheduled to go back to Chicago to see my mom, who, by the way, signed to let her 18-year-old son go to Mississippi. I was going to ask, how, how did you even get down there in the first place? Were you recruited by SNCC, or you just decided, I'm going to go take a Greyhound no. bus? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't have that kind of horse. Um, it, it, what happened, um, you know, we, you, you and I know the history of the, of the challenge at the Democratic Convention. So there was the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. So they had a, ma a mock election, not a mock. They called it a real election in uh, um, and to counterpose it to the mock election that, that the state party, right. Democrats right. are. Elected. So they called for volunteers to come down to staff that. And so a bunch of my friends uh, told me on the, and they came to the hamburger stand where I was working. They said, Fred, we're going to Mississippi. I said, well, oh, wow, all right. So I went home and I told my mom, I'm going to Mississippi. And I don't know when the option came up, whether or not I could stay or not. But I went with the idea in my mind, I was safe more than, the week or two that my friends were saying they were going to go back to school. I wasn't in school and I, I couldn't think of anything better to do than spend time there. So I went down and I got sort of interviewed and uh, I got sent, uh, we got sent to different places after two or three days. And I think we went to the, uh, the school in Ohio that, that one school where everybody went to be trained. I forget the name of it. Um, this is like 60 years ago. Right, it's is that, was it Oberlin? I know there was some yeah. there and then the Highlander School in um, Tennessee was a big one. I went to Highlander later. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wouldn't remember Highlander. Um, anyway, uh, I, they let me stay, and I stayed at two different projects. And actually, uh, uh, so I did some work. I'm, uh, I probably did more partying than work, and uh, I. Uh, anyway, so I was there, and uh, that's how I got to uh, uh, to be in. in uh, meeting Stokely. I had met him before, you know, and Stokely comes from a very interesting background. He he tried a lot of different political ideas before he became a, a, a African nationalist kind of guy. And uh, he, uh, he, he flirted with communism. He flirted with a lot of other stuff. And he, you know, he figured out what was what he thought would work. So we, uh, I went to Chicago, I raised money uh, because I, uh, I was getting like $5 a week as COFO staff. Even in those days, $5 a week didn't go forever. And what, were you staying with a host family or were you staying, where were you yeah. living while you were there? I always lived, well, in, uh, Greenville, we when I first got there, we we all stayed at the Freedom House, and we laid on that must have been like twenty, thirty of us laying on um, newspaper on the floor, and uh, that got to be a little ticky because some of the people were 
older and more adventurous to me, and they became, how can we put this, more than just friends. And, <laughs> the constant problem within those organizations. Yeah. Right. And uh, Muriel Tillias, who was a project writer, went ballistic. And, you know, because all the racists needed to was, you know, a bunch of free love, miscegenation, all this crap. Anyway, um, after that, I always stayed with local people. And that was like, I cannot tell you the gratitude I have. The how people would let us into their houses and the risk some of them took to do that. It was, you know, you, it is, I can't find somebody to let me in if I get locked out of the house nowadays. Right. Were these all black families or were they some white families well, we, too? Well, we try, when we, when we did the white folks project, and it was based on building a, um, a daily uh, tractor driver's unit in a county called Nisipina, which is like the 10th most uh, poorest country, county in the United States. And black tractor drivers made $6 a day and white drivers made seven. Mm -hmm. So we were gonna, this guy, Ted Pearson, who was a young white guy from Texas, and he had a bit of a Southern Texas accent. It was in Cor Corsicana, Corsicana. So him and I were gonna organize it. And we were gonna use this, the stick model when they first went to M Mississippi, they, they would go to, and people would ask them where they stay. And say, I'm just leaving in the back of my car, and people would 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 invite them in. So they figured that would happen with us, maybe. Well, we spent a lot of time in the car. <laughs> um, uh, I don't remember us being invited by a white family. I just remember we found like three or four white families, uh, tractor drivers, who were very interested. I mean, they didn't want to have their daughter marrying a black guy. But they did, they knew that the division between black and white drivers was costing them money. Mm -hmm. They wanted to change that. Naturally, the Klan, the first people the Klan went on were the white. Right. Because, which is always the case. Get them into line, get them back into the racial line. Right, because if there is a break in that wall, then all hell breaks down. Right, and that's that's been the history of uh, how they broken up many multiracial uh, movements in the South, and there were a number of them as you probably uh, probably in your books, which I sorry I haven't read yet, but I will. Um. Um. So uh, then for some reason, so we did this like for two months and we weren't really getting anywhere. And then a big school boycott erupted in, the, in Issaquina County. And then Bruce had to go back to Texas. I don't know, I can't remember the reason. So I was there by myself. And I think he took the car with him. So I joined the Issaquina staff and it was led by a woman by Unita Blackwell. There's a little book that uh, written about her. And Unita had a fifth grade education and she just took me in hand and told me what to do, when to do it, I stayed in the house with her and never been so with her and her, her husband and her her son. And there was a young girl staying with them. I've never been so cold in my house. I was what you know what we call a shotgun out mm -hmm. with a wood stove. And that wood stove, I mean, we would get up periodically and put some wood in there, but there was no insulation. 
<laughs> you know, they had no money. I mean, uh, I mean, I, she was a project director for SNCC, and he worked on the um, on the levees, and you know, that was only like five, six months out of the year. Uh, I stayed there, but fool that I am, I became friendly with the young lady staying there. And you need to drag me out, said, what are you doing? Again, you know. Because this is a this is a black, young black woman. Yes. Yeah, black woman, yeah. yeah. In a town of 130 people. So everybody knows everybody. Mm -hmm. So they quickly found another place for me to stay. Right. I was, you know, I was 19 years old and uh, I, you know, I was interested in girls. I was interested in fighting racism, but I was also interested in girls. Um, um, so I then spent the, the rest of my time in a sort of uh, in the Issaquina Sharkey area. The White Folks Project failed. It, there was no more. It was the, la the one before it failed because. The rumor was there were eight women and nine guys. Who knows if that was true? It could have been. You know, uh, there were a lot of very interesting people, quote unquote, during the 60s. But, did, so, did you run across Bob Zellner while you were there? I believe he was in no. that area as well. During the... um, he was at another level. Yeah. I, I spent a lot of time with Unita, um, and then they gave me a responsibility. I don't know why, I think I was like the only white staff left. It was a small project area and I was educable. Um, I could, I mean, uh, I had a hard head, but people liked me and I became uh, like, I went to um, live at this one woman's house, Phyllis, and her brother, Jack, was like six, three, six, four. And Jack and I just became best friends. Mm -hmm. We just was like, he was um, my brother by another mother. He just, we had so much fun. We would go up to Mount Bayou, which is the all black town. Mm -hmm. We'd go to Judah, we'd, we'd play Sam Cook, we'd flirt, we'd dance. Jack was like, no, 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 that woman's married, Fred. Come over here. <laughs> yeah. These guys, they didn't pull up, they had knives, and they don't care if you're a civil rights worker. You're right. not messing with them, right? Be, dummy me, I don't know. Anyway, but I learned. And, you know, Jack would, uh, all right, you can edit this part out. Jack, <laughs> Jack was the best. Nicest human being. Give the shirt off your bed. But he had two ex-wives and a wife, and he was still messing around with his, own, his two ex-wives. Right. That's it. And then when I told him, I thought one of his ex-wives was cute. He said, oh, you like Emma T? Let's go talk to her. Maybe she'll like you too. <laughs> he needs one taken off his plate. It's too many. <laughs> Thanks, <I don't. laughs> anyway. Uh, but it's, how I mean, long I, were you there um, in total? 10 months. Wow. And those 10 months are like 10 years to me. I mean, I, I remember the Roosevelt family. They had a, like a seven acre farm and they invited me. Uh, I stayed over and I, they had breakfast and they had fried chicken, pork chop. They had, this is before food stamp, it was all commodity, like this low level commodity spam. And they would put in spaghetti. Yeah. Anyway, and then he would go off and work early in the morning. 
So I went off and I got on, on the tractor and started driving. They said, uh, Fred, maybe you'll do something else. Get off the tractor. <laughs> but you know, uh, but I learned how what, what the work was like. I mean, I, uh, uh, I, 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 I was very cognizant of what the social uh, constraints were, and I knew I was conspicuous. I mean, there weren't too many white guys who were hanging around with, with black people mm-hmm. in this party. And I met this one young lady. Uh, her name was Sophie Geanley, and she's very, very nice. And I asked, well, can I come visit you, you know, come court? I did other stuff than this, but I did, you know. I was 19 years old, and I was not very experienced when I went down there. So, uh, and uh, I didn't have, like, a good image of myself that I would be attractive to people before I went down there. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I went and uh, she said, well, I'll be working on uh, one of my dad's fields. Come by and talk to me then. So I get in and for some reason, I had the project car. Here I'm 19 years old. And they give me a brand new white Plymouth to drive around. Why they thought I, I was responsible enough to have it, I don't know. They don't. It was like controlled chaos at times. Uh, and you know, Snick was going through all these changes. Was there uh, ever and, any talk about socialism and communism explicitly within SNCC when you were there? Or were those discussions at kind of the highest level kept you know, very secret? Those, well, I knew that they had friends in the Communist Party. And the national, what was called the National Guardian, mm-hmm. which was a newspaper put out by people who were very close to the Communist Party was in a lot of the project, larger project area. Now, in a, a small project like where I was, it was more, I would talk about stuff like that. But it wasn't a something that was in the freedom schools. And uh, now I know that in Sunflower County, where uh, a guy by the name of uh, John Harris and Jim Dan were, they were a couple of years older and a lot smarter than me. They were discussing those kind of advanced ideas. Right, and they were, uh, that's exactly where they were um, trying to make all the, the interracial union unions, I think at that time was in Sunflower County. Not so much that I recall. That was the Freedom House that was attacked and they defended it with guns. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's the book that Jim Dan wrote. Um, And uh, they they had a tremendous base in uh, Ruleville where the Freedom House was, which also was the home of... uh, uh, Eastland, who was the senator. Um, I I don't remember having a lot of um, really intense. I mean, nobody was talking about the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, but people who like, like the people who uh, who uh, were the the lawyers for the Mississippi Chandler, uh, Consular Canoy, both came out of the Communist Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably Canoy was still a member. I don't. Consular was. Who I I I don't know what Consular was. It was very strange at times, from what I saw. 
Um, but they were brilliant lawyers. And uh, um, we know that, um, well, Highlander, they say they weren't in the Communist Party, but I'm convinced half of them were in the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. uh, so you did go to the Highlander School later, oh, yeah, you said. I so when did that when did that occur? That happened. Uh, it must have been spring. Oh, I know how it happened. Um, my buddy um, Pearson said we're going to go because so he got us hooked up into a labor thing where we're we're going to be trained. I forgot all about how that happened. Oh, man. So this is while so, you were in Mississippi or we after? Mississippi, we, went up, we went up to uh, Knoxville for training. And then um, because um, my buddy was big on the Bible, we went and met with a guy who was like a communist preacher. And he lived in northern Alabama, and his name escapes me. But he used the Bible to preach communism. So we spent a day with him. Wow. And this was a, a black preacher or a white preacher? White. Wow. Yeah. He, I think he's in the hammer in the hole. And uh, his name will come. Unfortunately, as you get older, you do have these memory blocks. I get it. Believe me, I've got uh, Robin Kelly's book on the shelf. I'll pull it right after this and I'll be able to tell people exactly who it is. Well, he just, uh, and he was active in the, and he was active in the tenant uh, farm union. Um, you know, there was a communist wing and there was a socialist wing of that union. Um, so, yeah, and we, was it, you know, it, so there were, there was always, more discussion, but I was more overwhelmed by doing the work and being with the people. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I built relationships. I'll give you an example of how I think about how formative it was for people like me. Uh, many years later, like 40, like somewhere around the year 2000, so we're talking about almost 40 years later, I had a day where I was out of pocket. I'd done all my work. Nobody knew where I was. I was covered. So, and I had a company car. And I was in Birmingham. And I said, what am I going to do today? My friend who lived in Atlanta was with her boyfriend. I, you know, I had nothing. And I didn't want to hang around Birmingham that much. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go drive to Myersville. So I got in the car. And I drove like 250, 200. In those days, I could drive. Nowadays. I can't drive 20 minutes. Uh, and I went, and I went to the little store right up Highway 1, where I used, always used to go in the morning. And I started talking to the guy, and he, I asked some questions. He says, you seem to know some stuff around here. Right? Yeah, I used to hang around here. He says, you look familiar. I said, you look familiar. And then all of a sudden, this woman comes out, and she takes one look at me. She says, Fred! And I said, Phyllis! It was wow. Jack Button. Jack Button's sister. Wow. And, you know, it's like that's the kind of experience that I and you know, of course she told me Jack was dead and you know, all this stuff. But, but I had stayed there and it was a particularly nasty kind of thing because her husband was working for the guy who's how store we were buying what guy 
So eventually, after a while, Phil's had to kick me out of the house. I've had to find somewhere else. But, you know, it just, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, it was, I, I, I can't, uh, I'm sure if I, if I, if I, uh, it was the same thing when I, uh, when I, when I saw Unita, we just picked up and we started talking about people, you know, I was like, Unita was, oh, fifth grade education. This woman would have been running a corporation. Mm -hmm. Did you stay in touch with some of them after you left Mississippi, or was that pretty hard to maintain? Um, I had a girlfriend for a while, and I went down. But after I made the decision that I wasn't going to, to live there, my plan was to move there. That's what my plan I don't know what I thought I was going to do for a living, but I, I mean, I, I had a girlfriend, a really sweet girl, very Christian girl. So I don't know what I thought I would, anyway. And she liked me and, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, it's just, uh, I, we were never very physical together because she was, she wasn't that kind of girl, but I, I, she was a really fine person. And uh, I, I, I could see where a man could do a lot worse. All right. But anyway, but after I had, I kept some ties, but whatever I did. You have to remember by 1960, I left Mississippi in 65. By the fall, 65 was a free speech movement when Berkeley, then there were huge anti-war, uh, there were tremendous anti rights So I got involved and I eventually became an uh, organized communist. I joined something called Progressive Labor Party, which was a Maoist communist party. Mm -hmm. And this is when you, you, you went back to Chicago or? Yeah, I, I went back to Chicago. I, 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 I have uh, in my mind uh, like three or four homes. Uh, in a way, Mississippi will always be home to me. I can, I can tell you all the counties. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, you know, we're forty nine W at sixty one and one. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I'll always have. Uh, I read two, uh, two Chicago papers every day, and I'm a White Sox fan, and I'm a, a Bears fan, and I'm a Bulls fan, and I drive all my friends and relatives in California crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and uh, uh, of course, I, you know, I identify a great deal with New York because I have uh, so many memories and um, and my dad would tell so many wonderful stories about growing up in New York. And, you know, I, anyway, I, uh, my wife is a uh, Filipina. So she has a city there, a city called Bacala, which I've been, been to like 10, 15 times. So, but, um, I, you know, I, yeah, I, lived in Chicago until 1999. I was involved in anti-racist uh, activity all my life. Mm -hmm. I, I joined a group called the uh, International Committee Against Racism, and we attacked the Klan. We invaded the Nazi's office in, Mon in uh, Marquette Park, which was a extremely racist neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, so I, and uh, those experiences in Mississippi, I knew I would always be an anti-racist, made it so much more in my DNA. And uh, I live in Orange County, which is not as white as it used to be. And, uh, uh, but you know, I, I usually run into people 
and I tell them stories. And uh, I tell them the stories I tell you. Okay. Well, part of it is because it's self and grind and people, you know, think, oh, you're a big. That's just what I was. Not what I am, because I don't think I have the guts to do what I did then. I look back, I said, what, were you crazy? <laughs> There's a reason everybody's that young when they're doing that stuff, because you, you're, you're not putting it together how much you're putting your life on the line every single day. Yeah, I guess so. And we know what, you know, and you, you don't know what you're putting your parents through. Yep, exactly. I have a kid, I can imagine my poor mom. Did you know. your sister get into organizing as well, or did she stay in the Chicago area? Or my sister um, later on. First, she wasn't a man. My sister uh, was very attractive, and uh, men liked her, and she liked men. So, uh, unfortunately, she ended up with a guy who was a ex-con who. Then became a convict again, and was in uh, uh, Wyoming. But eventually, she moved to um, California, and uh, my dad and my stepmother brought her back into things. So she subsequently joined the Communist Party. So there was there was always a big gap between me and the rest of the family because I was to the left. To my mind, to them, but you know, we loved each other. So when so. we when we began this interview, it was really really breaking up when you were talking about your parents. Can you just give a, a brief? Um, you tell tell people where they came from again, and and what their jobs were, and kind of how they came into the how they got involved in the Communist Party. Well, I, my dad was born in 1914 in uh, New York uh, on the Lower East Side. My grandfather was born in the part of uh, uh, Russia called around uh, Ukraine. It's a, he lives in a little shuttle, small little village. And um, he moved because um, he didn't want to be in the Czar's army. Um, they lived in the Lower East Side, and then they moved to a neighborhood called Brownsville in Brooklyn. And subsequently, they moved to Queens. Um, and my dad um, uh, was uh, one of these guys who could do a lot of things. He could, he could uh, build things. He could. Uh, he could, uh, he could he could tell jokes, and he was a pipe smoker all the time. Uh, we have family pictures of him smoking a pipe and me smoking a pipe next to him. Everybody said we looked look exactly right. We didn't think so, but after a while we gave it up. Um, and my dad, during the Depression, they they uh, they used to make uh, homemade wine. So my dad learned how to make homemade wine. And he was, he was in the game, but he, he was in a tough area of Brooklyn. Um, one of the first things my dad taught me when he came back from America was how to box. Um, um, yeah, it was important that you know how to defend yourself. So I don't know exactly who he met, but anyway, he was involved in the Boy Scouts. And the Communist Party in New York was very, very big. I mean, you know, uh, not everybody, but when, when, when McCarthy said there were communists everywhere, he was right. There were a lot of communists. And I thought that was a good thing, but that's me. Um, he became like, the explorer, the Communist Party controlled the Brooklyn Boy Scouts. Mm. My dad wow. worked full time. Yeah. And of course, 
whenever we went camping, my dad could do it all. All right. So then for some, he did uh, trade you. He also did some writing. He did some sports writing for the old Brooklyn Eagle. And uh, the Communist Party always were looking for people, right? So he wrote a little bit uh, for sports. And then he got involved in the trade union work in New York. And uh, my dad knew how to talk to people. And uh, he could tell stories. My daddy could. Uh, I could tell stories a little bit. My dad, I loved my dad's stories. Of course, I wasn't smart enough to tape any of them. <sighs> so um, he then, because of a family problem, moved to Chicago, and he moved up the ranks of the Communist Party. He went to work in a factory. He organized the union there. He organized a club called Foot. It was a factory called Football Brothers, and they had a hundred members in the Communist Party in this one factory. Wow. Yeah. I don't think they have a hundred people in Chicago right now, but I mean, it was just, you know, and he became the leader, one of the leaders. And, and as I said before, as the party got smaller, his job got bigger. Eventually, he, he was on the Central Committee of the Communist Party. So I got to know all the leaders of the Communist Party. And some of them were really great human beings, and some of them are, were a waste of space. Did you ever meet me. Harry Haywood? No, because Harry was to the left. And he wasn't, my dad was one of um, William Z. Foster's boys. There was a whole group of left wingers uh, who were around Foster. Mm -hmm. And Harry was more. Uh, of a nationalist, and the party went back and forth on the question of self determination. Um, uh, and later on, then Harry moved even further to the left, where you know he, I think, made some very good criticism of the Communist Party. And uh, you have to remember that the Communist Party actually dissolved under the leadership of this idiot jerk um um earl browder you know he decided that you didn't need a party you could just have some votes and the rich people will let you have socialism mm -hmm. so eventually he was kicked out and uh so he was involved with those struggles and uh I don't know. Maybe it was maybe it was a career path. Yeah, you know, I mean, being ha hanging around with Harry would probably would not be a good career path in the Communist Party. Right. I don't. I don't know. Um, you know, my dad never sat down and talked talk to me about it, his career path. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, he never. That was. He liked being a leader and liked being knowledge, but. He never wanted to be number one. Mm -hmm. I can tell. Uh, you know, anyway, and he liked the move to uh, California. He he really enjoyed that. Um, he moved from Chicago because my mom caught him cheating for the third time, and she told the party, "What are you going to do about it?" And of course, being the gutless wonders that they were, it's, they punished him by forcing him to move to Los Angeles from Chicago. Wow. This is, isn't it? So wow. my job was, if they caught him fucking up again, what are they gonna do, send him to Hawaii? Right, right. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has gotta be interesting for you to see what's happened in the last few years, especially with the Black Lives Matter um, protests and really kind of how interracial those protests are and, and the movement is. And what what do you think that some some of the major lessons that, that people, activists especially, could learn from your experiences? Uh, 
Love the working class. Listen to the working class. Be of the working class. Don't be the messenger. Be part of the message that we're building together. Doesn't mean I don't have very clear ideas. I mean, I I believe that you need a revolution and you need armed struggle and you need a communist party. But you have to listen to people. Mm -hmm. And you have to be friends. So I trust you with the stories I tell you. But we don't tell everybody all our stories till we get to know each other. Mm -hmm. And if people think you're going to change somebody's mind with a demonstration or with a leaflet or with a newsletter, once you're friends with somebody, it's like in a marriage, once you trust each other by what you do, not just what you say, but what you do, communists need to be the three o'clock in the morning person. All right, so how many people do I know that I can call at three o'clock in the morning and say, I need. Mm -hmm. There's not that many, but that's what we need in life. Because we need to know that we're not alone all the time. I mean, we're born alone, we die alone. But there are times that, and sometimes you get, you get that from strangers. I mean, you get into the South. I've had, I had a car broke down. Two white guys came, stopped. They knew exactly who the guy was. They fixed my car and told me to get the hell out of there. Yeah. And I did, you know, it was like, where are you from? Oh, I'm down there. Oh, all right. They know exactly. They could see the, the CB radio and they knew what a white Plymouth was. It wasn't a big a mystery. Some of it is that. They were all in it together. But to have ties, to have a base, not to talk to each other, but talk to other people and then talk to each other. It's all practice and theory. Your theory is developed by your practice. All right. The other thing is that Identity politics is a loser. And nationalism is a loser. Sexism is a loser. Uh, nobody, oh, I, I, I guess there are some feminists who don't want to have anything to do with men. I consider myself, my primary identification. It's not a, as a working class Jew, although I'm very much a working class Jew. Um, it's, it's not as a, a guy from Chicago, although that's very much. I'm a member of the international working class. So a worker in Pakistan, a worker in Afghanistan, a worker in Ghana, a worker in Edmonton, a worker in El Salvador, in Samoa, where have you? That worker, man, woman, child, is more to me than any Rockefeller ever will. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in white skin privilege. I believe that we, blacks and other minorities, are super exploited. That you cannot win by telling somebody you're privileged. I spend a lot of time talking to white workers in Orange County. They don't think they're privileged. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're privileged. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I don't think I'm white. I don't think I'm fucking privileged. Does that mean I'll get stopped while driving like a black person would? Of course not. But this idea 
of white skin privilege, of white supremacy, it is another killer what will divide the working class. The fight, just like the, the uh, women who can't say you can't trust men, you can divide, you gotta find a ways to unify. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I, that's what we did in the, in the civil rights movement. We took a community, we, a community that was divided, unified. Because the black community was very much disunified when the civil rights movement came in. And we was still disunified. I mean, every struggle in the South, there was always a right wing. There were preachers, there were labor leaders who were, there were all kinds of people who, quote unquote, are on the side of the people who, who were not. Mm -hmm. And then we left. A lot of us didn't know what we we're doing, and we, and we did things because it felt good or because we wanted people to admire us. We all have egos, right? I mean, you put your name on the on your book. Right, so, absolutely. You know, you know, and you know, I'm doing this because, oh, wow. Well, I'm gonna, somebody interviewed me, right? My little ego goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. But, uh, you, you, we all know you cannot just live for yourself. Right. And this, I, I'm so, so grateful for you um, to do this interview, to share your time today, because I think there are so many people needing to hear this message. And especially after the last two years of all of us having to live almost in complete solitude, you know, yeah. that message of how much we need each other is more important than ever, I think, at least in my own lifetime. And um, and I, I promise you, I will share this with everybody on social media. We will donate it and get it to the SNCC Legacy Project so they can put it up there. And um, hopefully, maybe in another few months, we'll we'll do do this again and uh, can share some new stories. All right, well, I'll, I'll tell you one last thing. The easiest way I think to get concepts I'm groping with is the idea of family. So I have a kid, a kid, he's 28 years old. And um, I used to read these stories. Well, when I was growing up, I would read all the novels from the Russia. That's what we had in the house, right? Some of them were good, some of them, who, who wrote this crap? Anyway. Um, you know, I, I, I uh, uh, there was the old story about how in Stalingrad workers would be building tractors and then taking guns and going fight, and how they would go on suicide to save the factory. They knew they, knew they weren't going to make it. But it was something they were willing to die for. And, you know, I said, well, die? That's a big thing. I don't want to die real. Anyway, you know, I'm willing, I'm willing to get that a path. And then my kid came along. I said, if there was a car coming at my kid and I was standing there, what would I do? Like most parents, I would jump in front of the car. And the kind of idea, we have to have that idea about not just the biological, not just, but the kids are dying right now in the Ukraine, the kids who are dying in Yemen, the children who are dying in Palestine, the, the families that are being torn apart in Israel because of the racism, the Zionists and all the ugliness that makes me as a working class Jew, wretch. Because that's not how you treat family. Until we get the human race to treat each other as family. Not all of them. I, uh, my attitude is uh, how I want to live. My friend, you said, well, 
I don't know, anyway, I made I won't either want to die in my sleep or with a machine gun. I have a lot of class hatred. I hate the people who run this country. And I would put them up against the wall and shoot them without any compulsion. They're not my family. If you're my family, I will shoot everybody who comes against you. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us today. And I, like I said, this is this is going to help so many people. This is this is going to go down in posterity. We'll we'll have you on camera now with all of your amazing stories. It's really it's crazy how much life you have lived already. So thank you so much. I really really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And we'll we'll do this again soon. I hope you have a, a good rest of the week. Thank you very much. All if right, I can yeah. find my damn wallet, I'll be happy. Oh, there you go. Good luck. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.